the, our talk today, our talk for this session is when DevSecOps fails with Tanya Janka. Before we get started, I'd like to thank sponsors, especially the Inner Circle sponsors, Critical Stack and Valley Mail. Our stellar sponsors, such as Amazon, the National Security Agency, Silence, and others. A reminder, everybody, cell phones. This is a live stream event, so please double check, triple check your cell phones. Feel free to check them right now. We'll make sure they're on silent. And at the end, if there is, uh, if you have any questions at the end, there is a microphone in the center of the room. So please use microphone to ask the questions. So with that, um, welcome Tanya Jenka. Hi, everyone. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I, uh, I have a weird career, and I do a lot of consulting with different really big companies, like companies that you know the names of. And then I also, my company was bought earlier this year by the nice folks at Bright Security, so I work for them. But as a result of all my weird consulting, I have seen a lot of companies do stuff, and not all of them went well. And so over the past couple of years, since I've been doing DevOps and DevSecOps sorts of things, there's like a trend of crap that goes wrong. And so I have noticed quite a bit of this. Um, so we're like, we're gonna do DevSecOps, and then it feels like this for the dev team. Um, stuff like, the security team's like, cool, we bought a SaaS and a DAST and an SCA, and we got a secret scanner, and then we bought this like weird startup thing, we did it, and then we put it all in the pipeline, and then the pipeline ran 10 hours instead of 10 minutes, and no one wants to hang out with us anymore. And so I at first was writing this talk, and then I, I was like, when DevSecOps fails. And so I wanna talk about how we can avoid those common mistakes. And the thing I wanted to tell you at the beginning of the talk to try to help you pay slightly more attention is that I brought what I like to call the maple secrets from Canada. So in Canada, we have these things called maple trees and they leak candy, I kid you not. Their syrup is sweet and delicious and delightful and we make candy out of it and I brought candy. So if you ask a question after, I'm gonna give you a candy all the way from Canada and everyone gets stickers because that's how I am. Okay. So, I, uh, so, uh, who, so what is DevSecOps? So this is what this talk is about. So if you're like, DevOps, software development, that's the worst, you might not wanna be here. So what the heck is this? And so like, what is Tanya gonna talk about? So we used to make software a zillion years ago doing waterfowl. And I mispronounce it because sometimes I say water fail. But basically, waterfowl at first was good because it was way better than no methodology for building software. But we realized quickly about 70% of projects failed. I don't know if you know that. Um, so I went, I went to college in the 90s and like, yeah, it didn't go that well. Um, so then Agile, like really smart people came up with this Agile thing and it's like, instead of waiting two years to ask if people liked what we made, what if we asked regularly? <laughs> What if we met every day to like see how things are going on? And so that improved a lot. But then DevOps happened. And the idea of DevOps, I'll, I'll get into it more in a bit, but DevOps is not only a methodology for building software, it's a complete culture change. And so if you're like, we got a CI, CD, and we run it sometimes, you're not doing all of DevOps. You're doing part of DevOps. And that's still cool, and that's way better than doing none but there's so much more you could have. And so lots and lots of developers have been very excited about this for a while. The moment I heard of it, I was like, this is the best. Um, and then eventually security folks were like, why are the DevOps people breaking stuff? Why don't they stop for my nice gates that I made for them? <laughs> they wanna release eight times a day and I only have time to review code once a year. And so we had to, as security folks, kind of like, Get, get the net. We had to like <laughs> kind of catch up and see what they're doing. And so then I started getting a lot of consulting calls about like, how can we do this better? How can we not piss everyone off constantly, but still get things to be more secure? And so I, I just started having clients say, just tell us what goes wrong so that we can like work on that stuff from the beginning. Like we don't 
Because a lot of teams, they misstep at the beginning and they lose a lot of trust in the process. So I'm hoping we could go over these and then after we could have questions. And then maybe at 9 p.m. tonight, some of you want to sing karaoke with me, but you don't have to. You can just watch. Okay, so who am I? Uh, I am a giant nerd. This is the mandatory about me slide. Um, so I work at Bright Security. We make a dynamic scanner, and I am in charge of developer relations, which means I get to talk at conferences all the time, and they pay. It's the best. Um, uh, I founded my own nonprofit, or my own. It is for. It was for profit, just to be clear. Um, if you don't make profits, you're not a nonprofit. I don't know if you know that, <laughs> but anyway, I founded this online. Um, community and thanks to Bright, everything's free now. So if you're like, oh, this was awesome, I learned a lot. I have like a zillion courses I made and videos and tutorials and all of it's free. So go check that out. I'm um, like, I have purple hair and I wrote a book and I do stuff a lot. But basically I'm a nerd at large on the internet. That's like the main focus you should get away from this. And when I brush my hair, I look pretty good. Um, okay, so yay DevOps. So I love DevOps, I'm really excited. And so security folks, We've been like trying for quite a while to like get people on board the security train, especially software developers. And so we did we did not have good luck at this at first. So like I don't know about you, but when I was a software developer, when the security team started talking to me, I'm like, why are they bothering me and getting in the way of my deadlines? That was my opinion as a dev. Um, and so DevSecOps became a cool new look. So who's seen this slide? This is a very famous slide by a dude named Pete Schlejlock who's very smart. And he was like, this is how some security people see DevOps. Uh, they're like, you know, they're magical and amazing and they move fast and they break stuff and us security folks are left cleaning up their, as my friend Nancy calls it, rainbow poo. Um, but yay, marketing, let's call it DevSecOps instead. And then it'll be cooler and then people will do it. And so this is, this is the way that I view. <laughs> so they're still breaking things sometimes. They're still moving quite fast and sometimes it doesn't work out. But we're trying to train them. We're trying to give them tools. We're trying to help them. We're trying to like keep them on the track so they get there successfully. And we've learned that if devs do their works in sprints, we should try to do our work in sprints. If they're using a CI CD, some of my stuff should be in that CI CD. I should not just close my eyes and pretend it's not happening because I'm not going to get a good result. So marketing basically got involved and we're like, yay! Um, but so then vendors got involved and like we're at a community event that we would not be able to afford to be at if it weren't for nice vendors that sponsored it. And so I work for a vendor now. I'm vendor scum. I was thinking of making a t-shirt that said that, but anyway, <laughs> I digress. Um, but so DevSecOps made a lot of promises. So like promises that life would be like this. We would all feel like this all the time. But really it felt like, like what I saw with some products, because I've played with a lot of products. I saw this, so this is the system development life cycle. So requirements would happen, no security folks, complete silence. Design, security folks, nowhere to be found. Code, security people totally ignoring them, doing their own thing. And then they're like, oh, it's test. Let's run five tools on full blast in the pipeline and see what happens. Um, let's have tons of false positives and break the build. All the time, let's break every build, no. Uh, and then security being like, you guys suck. Uh, and then the devs being like, I don't like the security team anymore. I've seen this cycle a lot, unfortunately. And I know it seems pessimistic, but I want us to avoid this. So vendors promised life would be perfect, but they left out a few details. And like this kitty's like, I thought this was business class. Um, so I want to talk about how we can avoid failure, how we can like look like we're really smart and we've done this for a zillion years even if we're new. And if you've been doing this for a zillion years, maybe you're going to learn something that you could do even better. So that is the point of this talk. And I'm just checking my time because I talk a lot. I'm so good. Okay, so the first thing that I see a lot is failing builds for the wrong reasons. I talk to so many security folks, they're so like, I can't wait to start breaking builds. That's a little bit like saying, I can't wait to break their dreams. <laughs> like when you're a dev, so who here has written software before in their life? Okay, how many of you have pushed code through a CI CD and you're full of optimism and happiness and you're like, I'm gonna make it to prod, it's gonna be that day. Yeah, finding out the security folks can't wait to fail your builds feels bad. <laughs> like when you push to the CI CD, you're like, I'm gonna run a bunch of tests, but you're not like, 
this is crappy and I'm going to send it. You've like done a little testing yourself. You're like, I think this is pretty good. Let's run some checks. Okay. Today, like, I think I'm going to get there. So if we're planning to fail the builds just from the start, like this is not good. So I want to go over good reasons to build, to fail a build. So yes, false positives really suck. Um, okay. So the first one, if you need gates, in order to get security done, because a lot of people are like, I need to have gates, it needs to be part of a formal approval process. It's not security professionals who are using breaking builds to get your way. Like, it's not like I'm going to break their build to teach them a lesson. I have heard that. Like, I've literally heard that from adults. I, I walked in on these two guys once in the hallway where I had joined a team to do AppSec, and then I quickly left and worked somewhere else. And they were making faces at each other, like, you know, and then they would laugh, and the other one would make a face, and they would laugh. And I was like, what's going on? And they're like, we're making faces, we're practicing our you're stupid face. And I'm like, what is this for? And they're like, it's so when devs ask questions in meetings, we can make them know how stupid they are. And I was like, I can't work on this team. <laughs> I do not belong here. This is wrong. And so... We don't want to break builds. We do it if we have to. Okay, so the next one is the pipeline should not be the first time we look at security. Like, that shouldn't be our first thing that we ever do. Like, if they're, if they're spending time gathering requirements about what they're going to build, I want to be a part of those requirements. I, I want to have a requirement that's like, we're going to do this type of scan. P.S. Here's your license if you want to run it first so you always pass. Like, here's how I want you to build it securely, et cetera, in the design phase, threat modeling. Like, this shouldn't be the first time. And we're going to talk a bit more about that in, like, a few minutes in this talk. So the next one is test the accuracy of your tools for a long time before you break builds. So I put a tool in the pipeline, but I just have it set to give me data and alert. I don't have it. So it breaks the build immediately. Because who here has ever gotten a false positive ever on a product? OK, all of you are lying. <laughs> you're, or your arms are very heavy. Because like the first couple of tools I put in, I was just like, no, but it told me there's this wrong. And then it's, it's not wrong. I don't know what to do. And so it, I think it's important to put it in, make sure you've got it going as fast as it can go. You're like doing all of the things. And it seems to be going well. They've fixed the backlog of security problems that were already there. Then I turn on breaking builds. And it's for high things. And we see if they can start getting to prod with that in place. Cool. Then maybe we move on to mediums. But most places I go to work, they have like thousands of critical bugs that no one's fixing. And running around breaking builds isn't going to fix that. right? And so if I can alert them as to the problem, and then eventually they start fixing things and they start getting better, then eventually I can start breaking builds. So another one is you can't, if you can't get accurate results with your tool, that's okay. Do the testing outside the pipeline. So I don't know, maybe some of you have bought a SAST and not all SASTs are like this and people that make SASTs will be upset I'm going to say this, but some of them give a ton of false positives, like 90%. Like you set it to be very sensitive. And it tells you everything that could possibly be a vulnerability. And you're like, this does not belong in the pipeline. It just doesn't. We can't break a build all the time with false positives because we're breaking everyone's trust in us. So that doesn't mean you don't use your tool. So let's say you bought a tool, and, it, and it's from a super awesome company, and you bought it for three years. So you have to keep using this tool. No one's going to give you another couple hundred K per year to buy another tool. So you're like, I'm stuck with this tool, that's fine, but do the tests outside the pipeline or only do a few tests in the pipeline and then run like your big, huge, long 18-hour SaaS scan outside the pipeline, you could still have friends. This is important. Okay, so the next one is use out-of-band tests. Um, so this means like, sorry, <laughs> I, I like saw the next slide and was like, what, what am I talking about? Um, so use out-of-band tests. So what you can do is you can run a test overnight Take those results. Um, so my friend that works at a big company that makes really awesome athletic shoes, so you've heard of them, um, they took all the stuff out of their pipeline. And what they did was is they ran it all outside the pipeline every day. And then they send pass or fail based on their policy to an API. And so every time the build is run, it just checks the security API. And it's like, pass or fail, yo. And if you pass, you go to prawn. If you fail, you already received an email telling you how bad you are. You already knew. 
Um, and so that worked for them, and they went from an hour and a half long pipeline to a seven minute pipeline, and everyone was like, yes! Okay, so another thing is consider if you need your security to be perfect or just good. Most of us just need good. A lot of places I consult, they have, like I said, thousands of criticals, thousands of highs, an absolutely insane number of mediums. And then they'll get a tool and they're like, well, it's gotta be perfect and find every single possible low. I'm like, really? Why? So you could just ignore them and never, <laughs> you're never gonna fix the lows. Let's, like you're, you're begging to have one critical fixed a week. So it doesn't make sense for us to spend 10 times longer scanning to try to find those low vulnerabilities when instead we could have a scan that runs in like one tenth the time and yeah, it's gonna miss some stuff, but it's gonna be good. And so a lot of companies, I'm like, do you need to be perfect? Like, did you make the COVID vaccine? Are you doing anti-terrorism activities that are top secret? Are you Amazon marketplace? Well, then you probably could just be good. Most of us just need to be good. We don't need to be perfect. And so if you can be realistic with that, you could choose a completely different tool set and save tons of time. Oh, sorry, I'll put that back for you. Okay, um, so then the last one I want to say is celebrate success. When people get through the pipeline for the first time and they had to fix 400 things to do it, tell them how awesome they are. This is the thing us security team forgets. We forget to say good job, where usually they're like, you made a mistake, you're terrible, let me tell you how terrible. What if we were like, hey, this team made it through the pipeline the first time, let's give them a shout out. It sounds crazy, but... I've done it. Okay, so this is the picture slide. So if you wanted to take a picture of all the points I just made, you would take a picture of this slide with your phone. You don't have to, but you can if you want, and there's gonna be a few more of these. And I do these because I hate taking notes, but I really wanna have notes. So it's like, it's a hard, it's a conflict, right? <laughs> okay, so I think most of the people's cameras are down. So I'm just gonna give you one more second, but you gotta be like faster for the next slide. Just kidding, I don't really have anywhere else to be. Um, okay. Next. So then also I have the unicorn. I, I spoke at GrimCon this year and that's their logo and I just love it. Okay, so slow tools. So this is a thing I see a lot of. So, if, so I work at a startup and then we made a really fast tool. Um, but some of the original tools are like not fast. I would call them not fast. And so I want to talk about how we can go faster. So the first time I had someone run a static application security testing tool on the app I was leading the team to build, it took 18 hours to run, and that's not fast at all. That actually really sucks. Um, so, so I'm just gonna show you fancy cars. I don't know if you like cars, but they're very fancy. Um, so you could perform as much testing as possible before you go to the CI CD. So like as soon as someone checks in code, you can run automated tests. While the dev is deving, I know that's not a word, um, you can actually give them an IDE plugin so they can test things themselves. They can push things to their dev server and if you are an open-minded security team, you could give them a, a tool and they could be like pew, 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 and they could find things wrong. We don't have to do stuff only in the CI CD. So if you empower your software developers, they could do really cool stuff. So in the IDE, right when you check code in, then you can test as like a final last, just is everything fine? Okay, and then go to prod. And this can save a lot of time. Um, another thing is you can perform just a subset of tests in the CI CD. So there's usually things where I'm like, that will give me nightmares if we have that in prod. And so I will select those tests. And then I'll run other tests against the dev server. I'll run other tests when they check in their code. But then in the CI CD, I'm like, I'm gonna do these like six tests. Like if there's injection, I really need to know. But I don't care if the security headers are messed up. And I love security headers, but I'm not gonna break a build over it. So this is another way we could go faster. Um, okay, so use a HAR file to ensure your DAST acts like a laser. So let me explain this. So a HAR file, H-A-R, also known as HTML archive file, is a thing that you can record of you doing stuff in a browser. So QA people use these constantly. So I, who here has done QA before in their life? Okay, so doing the same manual test for the 10th time, it's not awesome. Um, I do not like it at all. And so they're like, oh, let's just automate it. Let's record myself doing it. And then as the devs continue to push stuff out, I'll just play the recording and it's like, it passed, it failed. 
So you can take a copy of those and shove it into a dynamic scanner. And when you do that, it only tests that thing. So let's say you're working somewhere and you're agile and you're using a CI CD. And you're like, oh, in the sprint we made these two features. The QA person's like, awesome. I'm gonna record a thing to, to do that and then they flip the, the HAR file to me. I shove it into the DAST. Instead of the DAST having to crawl and look through things and then brute force everything and figure out what's going on, it's just laser focused. You can make it take 15 to 20% as long as it usually takes by doing this. It only really works though if someone else is gonna record those HAR files for you. Because if you are an AppSec team of one, if you are a Uniforce, like I have been and many of you probably are, you can't sit there and like record HAR files all day, you'll die. But if you have an awesome QA team that does automation, you can work together, they can be your best friends, and you can like just be really, really fast. Okay, so next, I really like blue. This car is nice. Um, so only test critical or high issues and skip everything else. You can do this. Like you go into like a dynamic, a SaaS, whatever tool, and you're like, skip that, skip that. Just do these things. I'm scared about these things. My team's not ready for that yet. <laughs> and then you can just test the things you want to. You can also, is this the next one? Oh no, that's, that's different. Um, but basically, skip the tests that don't matter to you, right? So some, I, keep, I still find injection in prod all the time, despite OWASP's best efforts of alerting the entire world how bad it is. And so like, if I go somewhere and I do some tests and I find it, I'm like, well, that's gonna be the, one of the things I'm scanning for. But if I work at a place where they have really good AppSec education and they've been doing this a long time, their devs are doing a really good job, I'm like, I don't need to test for that. I know they're not doing that anymore. We've graduated off of that. Okay, so the next one. There are newer tools that work faster. Um, so specifically with SAST, I have noticed a huge trend in our industry. So there's the original SAST of whom I won't name, where if I'm a security consultant and I have three weeks to analyze the security of some code, I will use their product and I will make it perfect. And I will find everything that might be a vulnerability and I will dive down recursion. I will do all this stuff and that's awesome. But usually that's not what we're doing. Usually it's like, we need to secure these 500 apps and we only have two people to do it and one of them's busy. And so I'm like, oh, I'm gonna buy a newer next generation style SAST. Um, and just to be clear, I like SAST. I'm not trying to say anything bad about it, but I'll use one that's newer where instead of doing symbolic analysis, what it's doing is just matching known anti-patterns. It's like, I know if you have this pattern, you suck. It's so lightning fast, it's super, super fast, and I won't name some of them while we're filming because I try not to say good or bad things about vendors publicly, I, except one, but I'm not gonna say that. I'm gonna hold, I can do this, shut up. Um, <laughs> um, but basically, what you can do is like run one of these newer tools, it's not perfect, and you've accepted you're only gonna be good, and that's okay for where you are right now, and maybe in two years from then, you do wanna be perfect, but for now you're just gonna clean up the huge mess that the previous people left, and then you're gonna do that later. And next generation SaaS tools can do an awesome job of that. I'm sure they wouldn't tell you that. Okay, so teach secure coding. I realize that you're like, Tanya's really biased because she sells secure coding. However, my company got bought a few months ago and all my online training's free now, so I'm now not selling you that. But I think it's really, really, so first of all, take the free courses from We Hack Purple. If you have devs that need to learn secure coding, it's free, why not? But if you can avoid making a mistake in the first place, that's the absolute best thing in the world. If you can make it so the dev finds the mistake before it's checked into the code, that's the second best. If you can, like the earlier you find something, the cheaper and the easier it is to fix it, you're gonna save money, you're gonna save time. And sometimes when you find a bug way later, you have to use like duct tape and masking tape to try to fix it because it, it, like your design has changed so much and it's such a huge change. So if you can find things earlier, it's way better. And if you can avoid them, that's the absolute number one best. And then um, implement manual peer review of code. I know that that might sound silly, but like if you teach secure coding and then you have people check someone else's pull request before it goes in, you can spot so many things. Like you can avoid things getting checked in. So that's like the second best place that you can find stuff. Okay, and then I think this is the last one. Practice, 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 practice before you start breaking builds. 
So I like to run the pipeline. I run it again, I run it again, I run it again. And then finally, I'm like, I'm ready to break builds because the team is passing. And if we find a bug, it's probably going to be real. It's probably going to be very bad. And we really don't want it to get into prod. It will be a mistake. It somehow got past everything else and we will break it and we will know we should have broken it because it's a true emergency. When we break a build, it is similar to pulling the and on cord in an assembly line. When you stop an assembly line at a big company, it costs thousands of dollars a second. Every single person in the factory stopped and you stop because someone's arm is in a meat grinder. You stop because the one thing's breaking, the next thing breaking, the next thing, or the pieces are coming out wrong for some reason because a piece of equipment is, is broken. You, when you stop, it's serious, and we need to treat it like that so we can go fast. And so this is the picture slide for this, the summary of that. We still have three more topics to go. And as far as I can tell, I am doing okay for time. Yes, that's awesome. I also have like, a slightly silly meme after this that you probably don't need to take your things out for, but I really like to show it when I meet with CISOs. Um, how are we doing? Okay, I think we're good. Uh, so I finally checked all the boxes. That means we're secure. Finally. Oh, I wish I had his checklist. It'd be so much easier. Um, okay, so the next thing is an insecure system development lifecycle. So if we only do checks in the CI CD, we don't give them feedback, we don't give them training, we don't give them guidance. Like, we're setting them up for failure. Most software developers don't get taught security when they go to school. They get taught nothing. I wrote Alice and Bob Learn AppSec, and I approached university and college, so many of them, so many of them. They're like, cool, we'll teach the cyber students. I'm like, teach the devs. I wanna stop the problem from happening in the first place, not teach someone else how to mop it up. And all of them are like, that's stupid. Why would we teach devs AppSec? And I was like, <laughs> so now I'm writing another book about secure coding in hopes that maybe one day I will be accepted by academia, but I digress. So if we have no security activities during our, our system development life cycle, this is bad. And if we only have one in the CI CD, we're just doing it in the CI CD, it's late. It's more expensive this way. So I want to talk about very briefly because I will go on and on, like literally 250 pages according to my author or my publisher. I really like secure system development life cycles. So here's some things you could do other than just shoving tools into a CI CD. You could give project security requirements. What if we told them what we wanted? We might even get it. We could do a whiteboarding session when they're doing their design and just go over and ask a few questions and offer security advice. We could do security unit tests. So if they're writing lots of unit tests, we could turn some of them into security unit tests. We could do threat modeling. We could do secure code review or do static analysis of our code. We could look at our dependencies and make sure the dependencies are not really scary and known to be vulnerable. To use a tool for this, it's called software composition analysis. We could do secure coding training. We could do dynamic analysis. So sometimes called DAST, where you know, we're like pew, 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 and then we try to figure out what's wrong with the running application. We could do penetration testing. So penetration testing is the number one thing I see, and it's at the end of the SDLC, and it is the absolute most expensive way to do AppSec. Actually, no, it's the second most. The first most is when you have a giant data breach, and that's your first security activity. Sorry, correction. Yeah, and I was a pen tester, so just to be clear, I love, I think pen testing is important, but I think it should be the last final, like when you put the cherry on top of the cake of your security. Um, so security regression testing. So run those unit tests every time they check in the code, check your security again. Guidance for all technologies. So let's say they're making a serverless app. What if you gave them a list of requirements of what you wanted? What if you're like, you're building an API? Awesome. This is the API gateway we use. Here's how to use our service mesh. We would like to, you to do this, this, and this, please. Most security people are just, they, they don't say anything. They don't give any guidance. And they're like, you're so wrong. Why didn't you tell me when you knew I was building this? Why are you telling me I suck after? Tell me how to. Logging, monitoring, and alerting, because I say this a lot, no one listens. But basically, every phase of the system development lifecycle, I want you to know I'm there for you and that I can help you make a more secure app. That's what I want as an AppSec person. 
Um, so you don't have to do all of this, but if you just did one more of these than you're currently doing, you will see a huge improvement. Okay, did everyone get a picture that wanted a picture? Like wave around frantically and awkwardly if you still need time. You're not waving awkwardly, but I'll let you take the picture anyway. <laughs> okay, I made this meme, I'm so proud. <laughs> I was like, this is what they meant. This is what actually happened. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about people that don't fix bugs. So unfixed bugs. Um, don't worry, it's in the backlog, Tanya. We're totally going to fix it in 2025. Um, so I see this a lot. I see, a, like, a, so most clients that I talk to, the biggest thing they focus on is like, Tanya, they won't fix, they won't fix our bugs. Like we send them stuff and they won't fix the bugs. And sometimes the app tech people are like, we want 100% of bugs fixed in one day. That's our service level agreement. That's the SLA we want. I'm like, well, that, that's not happening. Um, and then devs are like, we'll get to it later. Like, we'll do it. I did the security for one of the elections in Canada, and I remember like a dev was like, we'll do it after the I was like, no, I do not want bug fixes after election day. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. So we have to find a balance of never and instantaneous bug fixes. So we want, when I say SLA, I mean service level agreement. So I say don't carve your SLAs in stone. So be realistic. So let's set realistic expectations for both sides so that you actually get what you want or what you need, like the Rolling Stones. So decide your organization's risk tolerance. So like I said, most of us don't need to be perfect. I used to do counterterrorism activities for the Canadian government, which obviously I can't tell you more than that. But we had to be perfect. Oh my God, so good to not have to be perfect now. <laughs> it's way less work. That last 5% is really hard. So then set our service level agreements based on what we actually want and then make sure they're realistic and fair. Like I've worked at places where like their security posture just needs to be not pathetic and they'll be fine. There are companies like that. There's lots of companies where they're, they're not a target for any reason. None of their data is sensitive. Everyone's pretty chill. And it's like, you don't, you don't need to be, you don't even need to be great. You could just be like, okay, and you'll be fine. So let's set realistic goals. Get management support. Get management to agree with you. Um, communicate why you chose those service level agreements and then start small and go like this. So if you don't have management support, if, so if you talk to the head of devs and they're like, I don't got time for you. This is not important, Tanya, go away. Um, I have a friend that's dealing with this right now and he's about to quit. He's like, they pay me $350,000 a year. <laughs> and he's like, I'm gonna quit because no one wants to do any app sec. And every day I'm a failure and it hurts so much. So if you get management support, life will be a lot better. And then being fair and compromising sometimes. Okay, so support teams in reaching their SLAs. So last year I did a three month stint at a company. They were a long time client. They lost their main AppSec person and I was moving on to doing another thing and I was like, let's do just three straight months and swap out your entire tool set and modernize your stuff. It was super awesome. And we, I had two, two different teams where it was a tool that had been acquired and one of them was 38 years old, so almost as old as me. And I was just like, we need to re-architect this. Let me get you more staff. And they're like, what, really? I'm like, yeah, you're not gonna be able to like upgrade off those dependencies. You have log4j version one. Um, <laughs> So let's work together and let me get you some money and or persons to help you to like modernize your app. It'll be easier to support, it'll be more secure, life will be good, we know we have to do it eventually. And so I supported them in reaching their SLAs and I gave them time to address their technical debt. And I gave them rules to triage, so if you see this, you've got to fix it, but if you see these things, we can talk about it. And then because they were really worried to meet me that I would be like, you suck. And I was like, you're in a bad place. Let's put you in a, a good place. So sometimes you have to help them reach their service level agreements. Oh, yes. So with triaging, I put like a few rules here. One more, that's it. Okay, so like, what do they have to fix? How do they validate things if, if your tool gives false positives sometimes? So I like to train them, show them how. Um, but basically, if you can make a grid 
Like if tool X finds this, 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 or this, you gotta fix it right away. If it finds any of these things, could you fix it in the next 90 days? Everything else, eh, I'm fine. Then they can just look at it and be like, I'm cool. It sounds weird and it takes time to set up, but once you have it, you have way less emails in your inbox. Okay, so let's um, set realistic expectations. So a thing I really like to do is figure out how a bug happened and how we can prevent it in the future. So if I see injection, okay, so let's give a lunch and learn on injection. Let's show everyone how to find injection. Let's show them how to review code for it. Um, and then I like to search all the repos and destroy it. <laughs> because if, if you see one problem, that dev probably worked out on a lot of things, and I kind of like searching code repos and finding patterns and destroying them. So that is my idea of a good time. Um, this is the picture slide, because there is a lot of things that I said there. There were a lot. And then we're gonna get on to the Bruce Willis-themed part of this presentation, because that's important. <laughs> Okay, so I started a training company not because that's what I necessarily wanted to do, but because I asked everyone what I should do and all of them said, I wish you would show me how you do the thing you do. And person after person was like, you should teach us how you do AppSec. You should. I would pay money for that. And it turned out people gave me money and so then I did it more and more and then I had a company. But I'm gonna talk about training New tech, dev, security. Um, so when I worked in the government of Canada for 13 and a half years performing public service, I did security for half of it and they gave me no training. Our budget was $2,000 a year Canadian, so it's like four American cents. And, and I really, 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 really wanted to go to SANS really, really badly. And, if you're watching Sands, I would love to go. Um, I would so take any of their courses if I could for free. But, but a Sands course in Canadian dollars is around $10,000. And so that would be five years of my training budget. I'm like, can I bank my budget? And they're like, no. I'm like, can I? And they're like, you cannot take all your teammates' budget. And so I never got to go. So I started speaking at conferences. I kid you not, for the sole reason that I could get in free and I could learn. And so is this causes problems. So there's a lack of training and knowledge. So training and knowledge are not the same thing. Knowledge comes from experience and learning. Sometimes you go on training and unfortunately don't learn that much. So Bruce Willis, what if we train them and they leave? I remember my boss saying this. I'm like, what if you don't train me and I stay? This is a problem, especially in public sector where the budgets are very small. If you like, when I worked at Microsoft, it was awesome. Gave me lots of training, sent me on all these things, paid for stuff. I was like, I'm a genius now. But before that, I had to figure out a way. And so I would like to just briefly, now that I do not sell training, um, perks of training your team. So this is stuff I've seen. So. Employees that receive training are more likely to keep working for you because it is a big bonus for them. It's awesome to be invested in. They're usually happier than ones that don't know what the hell they're doing. They're more productive. They make fewer technical errors and that can be very expensive. If you are lucky, like really lucky, they will share what they have learned with everyone else. So they come back with a book and then they loan it to everyone. They're like, hey, let me show you the thing I built. Um, lastly, they are potentially a security champion, and I really, really like that. Um, I'm a big fan of security champions. I talk about it a lot. I wrote a 10-point blog article about it because I just, I really love it, and that is how I have scaled most of my security programs because I realize there's like hundreds of them and one of me, and as much as I, I think I'm great, I'm not that great. <laughs> I'm not able to like talk to 400 people and get to know all of them and review everyone's code, so I need to scale. And with training, you can identify the really golden ones that might become a champion for you. Um, join AppSec, they said. It would be easy, they said. Oh, poor Bruce. So I wanna do a conclusion. Um, and like, oh, I'm totally awesome for time, yes. So I'm gonna give you a bunch of resources at the end, so we're not quite done. DevSecOps only works if you do the work. You can't just throw a tool in there and have it work perfectly and that's okay, you are still awesome. We must avoid false positives in the CI CD whenever possible. If you break the build and it is a false alarm, there's egg all over your face. Um, they don't forget. 
Yeah. Tooling must be fast, and if it can't be fast, or it can't have mostly true positives, we do it outside the pipeline. We're still awesome, we can still automate it, it can still be great, but it doesn't belong in the pipeline. The rest of the SDLC needs to have security steps. We can't, we can't just, can't only look then. We're really, we're losing an opportunity if that's when we start. Um, I negotiate with devs to fix bugs. I never come in, I'm like, you're doing this. I am not their boss. I have no possible way to control them. I am open to bribing them with cookies or training or whatever will work, but I cannot make them fix bugs, so I negotiate. Work together and be realistic, and sometimes that means we don't get the thing we want or we don't get it for a few more weeks, and we're stressed, but we'll live. Providing training and share knowledge every chance you can get because it will value you. So if you learn a cool new AppSec thing, maybe you wanna show all your security champions or talk about it at the all staff. Die Hard is a Christmas movie and I will die on this hill. <laughs> and, you, and you can do this, you really can do this. I hope that this made it sound more doable instead of less doable. You can do this for real. I'm not kidding, I wanna encourage all of you like, even if you just get one tool scanning in a pipeline, you're way ahead of where you previously were. You really are. And so with that, I would like to give you a few free resources. I like giving resources. Um, so I have a podcast. And um, so we just, we just recorded season three, like the first one of season three. And it's just about AppSec now. So it used to be about how to get into cyber. Then it was like mini cyber security bite-sized lessons. And now it's just gonna be all AppSec all the time. So I had my professional mentor, Sharif Kusa, on who's the founder of Software Secured and Reshift. And he is the person that got me to join OWASP and made me a chapter leader and like just encouraged me so much in my journey. And he's so smart. And I just got to pick his brain for an hour. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, I really like books. I really like these books. Me and my mom both agree that Alice and Bob Learn is the best book. Um, but any of the top four books in yellow are fantastic DevOps resources. I own multiple copies of each of them. Like I have the ebook and then I have the physical book and then I have the audio book because I like them so much. They're really, 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 really good. Okay, so the next one is the community. So like I said, my company got acquired earlier this year and now all of our courses are free, all of our events are free, the community is free, we don't sell anything now, we just teach and train and network for free. And so all of you are invited. Um, every Monday on Twitter since 2018, I have done this thing called Cyber Mentoring Monday. So I realized that me providing, a, finding a professional mentor just brought me to the next level. Like it propelled my career in a way that I never knew was possible before. And so I try to help people find professional mentors every single Monday, even when it's Christmas. It's pretty slow on Christmas in case you're wondering. Um, but basically I use this hashtag to try to help people join together and find each other. And it has resulted in lots and lots of jobs, tons of friendships, people like forming companies together. It's been really magical to see so many senior members of the information security community take time for free to help newbies join our community and excel. Um, I've been astounded by the generosity of our industry repeatedly. Um, Bright, so I work at Bright and they have a highly technical blog. So if you um, are using a tool and you find a vulnerability, even if it's not ours, um, we have how to fix it for like basically everything ever. Um, we also like sometimes they let me post stuff, like I set, I'm obsessed with Log4j and I wrote like a postmortem and they let me publish it there. So there's also like not just remediation advice. Um, me, so I'm the last resource I'm gonna list. Me, I'm a nerd on the internet and I um, tweet and make videos and I have a newsletter that I occasionally actually release. Um, and I really like making content and I really like hearing from you. And so I'm doing this ask me anything right now where people can just send me questions and then I make a video for everyone about it. And so I released nine last week and that was fun. And so with that, I wanna thank all of you very much for coming to my presentation because there's a lot of really cool presentations at this time. Um, and so, thank you, thank you, thank you. If people are brave enough to go to the microphone, you, and ask a question, you can't just stand there awkwardly. I mean, you can, but you won't get a candy. Yes, sir? 
You told us that we can have a candy for a question we made, so here's my question. Okay. Can I have a candy for any type of questions I do? Um, I was hoping, it would, yeah, you, you win, hacker, hacker, social engineer. Okay, next. <laughs> um, I'm in QA. Do you have a resource video on we hack purple about HAR files because those sound amazing. Okay, so we actually have a whole course. Oh my god, no, it, really? Yeah, and I'm actually teaching it tomorrow morning here at 8.30. So tomorrow at 8.30, me and my friend Akira Brand, also a colleague, um, we're going to teach how to make a GitHub Actions CI CD and then how to put, um, like, basically call our product from it. And we briefly cover HAR files. But, in, so I actually turned an entire online course out of it and then we show you how to do the HAR file thing with it. And it's me and the founder and so we're friends and we're ridiculous and there's a lot of cats. Oh we my just, god, I'm gonna cry. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Please join the community, we'd so love to have you. Yes! Please take your candy and also you can have stickers if you desire. Awesome. Hi. Question for you. Um, I'm a big fan of security champions. I think they're a great way to scale. Yes. Uh, on your blog or on your, your, char your chart for security champions, a lot of the stuff was set up one-on-ones and, you know, building connections. That starts falling apart as you get towards larger security champions teams, such as a uh, company I work for has 1,500 security champions. Any suggestions for very large orgs like that and how to scale past your... your Do you have 1,500 security champions or 1,500 devs? Security champions. Oh my god. So how many teams? Do you have 1,500 teams then? Uh, it's close, yeah. Okay. It's, so it's how... Large, very large org. How many apps do you... How many, sorry, how many AppSec people do you have? Uh, I'm not sure that number. Uh, that's okay. Or about 20. That's okay, but not yeah. like we never have as many as we want. Right. And so basically sometimes what I do with my bosses is I will explain to them like I need more staff and here's my return on investment that I can show you from that and here's how I can show you how I can't complete my job unless blah. And so it like let's say you have like six other people. So that's seven people, and you're like, we have this many hours and this many days. I can right. meet with like three security champions per day for 30 minutes, and then I have to do the rest of my job and address the things they told me and said. And so calculating this, I need this many more people. And if you're not going to do that, then I can't do the job as well as I want to. And so sometimes what I'll do is I'll pick, so I'll have every security champion attend the trainings, but then I'll only meet one-on-one -on -one like once a month or less or I'll just pick out the most sensitive, high high priority ones. And sometimes it's the big famous product, sometimes it's the one that's on fire, that's trash, that's dying. Gotcha. And so I usually make a nightmare list and a wonderful awesome list, if that makes sense. And I like try really, because like what a lot of teams do is they just focus on the cool new apps uh -huh. and they leave all the legacy behind. And as a malicious actor or pen tester, the first thing I do is I was like, last update in 2008, I'm starting <laughs> here. And so, um, explain to them, like, just based on the number of hours I work, how this is impossible. And if they say, well, you can meet with 16 people per day because you have eight hours, explain to them how that's bull. Because some of them will say stupid yep. things. Indeed. Does Thank that you. help? Yeah. No. You deserve two candies. Okay. Um, next, please. So you mentioned that your podcast, and obviously there's other resources for like... Can um, you speak more into the microphone? Yeah. I'm sorry, it's hard. So you mentioned your podcast, and obviously there's other resources that how you can get um, like training for it. But like, what would you say is a good resource to see for people who are looking f maybe if they want to get into... Like what's a good resource to see like, okay, this is what your typical day-to-day... Because -day, you know, obviously... Movies are bad, books are bad. Like they don't, they don't really show you what it's yeah. like to do that job. Okay. And for those people who are like trying to figure out, do they want to change careers, etc., what would you recommend? Okay, so I have three resources for you. So one is a blog post that I wrote called "Jobs in Infosec," and if you Google "Jobs in Infosec" and then like "She Hacks Purple," you'll find it immediately. It gets thousands of reads per month, and I wrote it like two or three years ago, and I describe every single job. Then there's this lady named Alyssa Miller, and she's speaking here right now at the exact same time as me, which really sucks because she, I wanted to see that. Um, anyway, she just published a book about all the different types of jobs with interviews of people who did those jobs. 
And then the third one is season one of We Hack Purple podcast, where I interviewed about 50 different InfoSec professionals and asked them all about their job and what every day was like and how do you get this job and like what personality traits make you better and stuff at the job. And then they give stuff on how to go get into that job. And so between those three things, you should be good. And if you don't remember what I said, tweet at me and I'll tweet the answer back at you in writing. So that's helpful. Awesome. Thank you. You deserve candy. Everyone who wants to come up and get stickers now because it turns out I'm getting booted in like four minutes. Yes? So, so this is a real case that I had. Um, and I'm an app developer. And the problem was so fundamental to the code. I'll tell you the end. The problem was so fundamental to the code that they end up throwing away the entire chunk of code and replacing with the purchase project. Okay, so that was, that, and that took years and years to figure out. But fundamentally, the, pro, the code was so broken that it had built into it an account takeover bug. Oh. So how do you manage an AppSec situation like that is so fundamental to a fundamental architectural failure of the code. How do you manage that sort of conversation? Um, do th have they said like, no, we're not fixing it? Well, no, I was the app person who found it, and I tried to fix it, and other people, tried. It, it was basically years of, we give up, we're gonna throw away the entire code base. Oh, wow. So I wasn't in, in security, I just found it, right? So I was wondering, how would you manage that as an app sec person? Because this is not a made up case, real. So sometimes a rewrite is necessary. Like, sometimes that makes it so much better, especially like, because of the performance and other things of the app and yeah. how it's easier to maintain. Yeah, but in this case, it was, I looked at it, and it was, it was like once, it was a, a just like, how do you manage it where you can't fix it? Fix is not, is off the table, and okay. everybody says, we love to, but we can't. Okay, so then I usually put a Band-Aid on it, also known as a WAF or a RASP. And so um, a WAF is a web app firewall, and a RASP is a runtime application security protection tool. A RASP is more modern. It's going to cost you more money, but it's going to do a better job. All the WAF people will just be quiet. Um, basically, but it's a binary, and you have to stick it inside your application. It takes a while to set up, but then it will block malicious input. A WAF is more like a bunch of regular expression that lives on your web server, and it's like, that looks bad, no. That looks bad, no but advanced attackers can often get past that, while a RASP is, uh, has better results and t tends to have less latencies but will cost more money and take significantly more time to set up, but less time to maintain. Okay. Does that help? I don't know, but okay. I wanna let someone else go. Okay, I am being kicked out now, I have to go, but if you two wanna go outside the door, I would love to take questions from you, and you still get a candy because you're still awesome.